Good afternoon. Oh, um, yes, a short case study um, for from our customer Wolfcraft. Um, yes, um, short thing about us, but I don't want to neck you too much. It's um, Marketing Factory is um, part of my company. Um, we are doing internet since 1996. Um, we are developing um, and maintaining sustainable web applications. Uh, some of our customers are really long-time customers located in Düsseldorf, 25 employees, and um, we do know really very well the home decoration, DIY, and building scene in Germany. Some of them are custom our customers, and that's me. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm doing web things since 1995. I'm since 1996, so nearly the beginning, marketing factory. Um, yes, if you do have any complaints about how the association spends its money, um, come to me. I'm the chairman of the business control community, and I must have a look at the books. Um, when I'm not coding, I'm an enthusiastic dinghy sailor, and yes, that's all. And I all want you to invite you to the Typo Free Camp rhein ruhr in Essen, beginning of November. It will be um, a great event. Yes, about the customer, it's um, Wolfcraft, um, founded 1949. Um, they are one of the founders, they are one of the first brands in the DIY industry in Germany. Um, they are manufacturing in Europe and they have won quite a lot of awards for their products. About the project, yes. Um, are there any people here younger than 30 in this room? So um, maybe what I will show you, <laughs> maybe what I will show you now might be disturbing for your eyes. Uh, so please close it. <laughs> That's. <laughs> I, I forgot to mention I have got a lifetime Photoshop band, so this was not done by me. Um, yes, that's our first version for Wolfcraft from 1997. Um, who of you can guess which kind of version of the browser was it? <laughs> so it was Netscape 3.3. Um, yes. And at that time, we needed that money um, to do this job. So it's one of our long-time customers, and I just want to step to the evolution of the web pages we've done. Um, Archive.org is doing a really great job. Uh, we had a flash version of this web page in 2000, 2003. And the latest version um, was 2012, which was a technical and all the stuff redesigned based on Type of Free. Um, before they didn't have any Type of Free, so 2012 it was the first Type of Free website from then. Yes, and it's uh, available in five languages, more than thousands of products and, lang and products in their languages. So that was the solution for 2012. Um, the technical background is that we do have a type of free installation. We do have a um, product information system, which is via Medici. It's a well-known German brand for product information systems. And this feeds the product informations into type of free commerce over here. And we get uh, the media files, which are um, stored via DEM, and some more minor extensions we are using. So, 2012, um, yes, the customer approached to us and said, okay, we need a mobile website. And besides, we already have begun printing QR codes on every our packages, so we need it very fast. And in 2013, we said, the technology progress of um, Responsive was um, nearly production ready. You have seen the first Responsive websites in 2011, 2012, but those were only one page or very simple pages, not very much structure, menus were not that clear. So we thought, okay, 2013, the, it, the technology is production ready. And Sven Wolfermann did a really good job in describing the process of how to doing a um, redesign or a um, re responsive development process. So our job was uh, at first to convince the customer, tell him, okay, we think a mobile website wouldn't be a good idea to do in 2013. We should do something else. So um, we convinced them. 
Um, when we are doing a responsive website, it's tablet ready, so you don't have to worry about it. You won't have duplicated content, so that's good in terms of CEO, and you also need, if you've got a separate mobile version and an online version, maybe more editorial work or more technical work, so doing this in one thing, it's um, quite good for you. So that's the easy part of convincing. The more complex part is to tell them, okay, we won't do any Photoshop. We would go and complete new progress, um, which is not an old process, a new process, and you have to work with us. You have to do something else. And uh, we had to convince him that it does not mean more work for him, because he thought, okay, maybe it's not that easy for us, and we had to convince us that it's not more work for us. That um, was the hard part of the convincing. But finally we said, okay, we want to do this project. Um, we offer you to do this um, as we do the mobile site and we see what's the outcome of the project and see how it works for us. Yes, S let's step a bit back to the um, workflow um, as it's normal in responsive web design. So you first build a content inventory to see which elements you have. You build up wireframes. Um, you build up a structure of content, which is nearly something like the page tree. Uh, you build a HTML prototype. You define breakpoints. I will come to this point later. You will buy, build the complete HTML CSS development. And finally, you got this, which is very important, custom approval. Next step is writing invoice. So <laughs> um, yes, putting this in the type of free world, the content inventory are the content elements which are defined for the website. The content structure is the page tree we all know. And the breakpoints are more or less content based. So how many elements can I put to besides or on top on in which rows? So that's the breakpoints. It's not device breakpoints. And this is so called, we call it development in browser. So we develop a web page, we change the layout. Um, and we present it to the browser in the browser the customer uses. So we don't need any Photoshop, it's just HTML and he opens it in the web page. Okay, that's the process which is more or less the process of a responsive web design. And yes, so 2012, we already had a content inventory. This is something we already built for a project, a set of pages where all type of free elements are included. So we can just check on these pages if every standard element of Typo3 is, is working. And so we had something like a content inventory. And since it's in Typo3, yes, we do have a page tree and can see everything on it. So um, yes, some things were already existing. We had the content elements and we had the page tree. So that's something we started. Okay, very fine. Um, so we have only to do the next steps. Um, from this point, no Photoshop was used. We had no Photoshop designer was harmed by doing the complete development of the responsive layout. So at this point, we did have the old layout, and we had no idea how the new layout would be, and we didn't involve any Photoshop layouts. So what we do at the next step, we took one real existing web page and we did four iterations with the customer in changing the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to the final result. So that's uh, the sum iterations, and that was the final result for this web page, which is just one page. We did it on one page, on one HTML of one page, and developed the complete result. Developed it in complete, so we also did it with all elements in the web page. There are real, H there are real links. There is no, no an image instead of it. There is no uh, a thing which looks like an image um, link and it's not a link. So we did it incomplete. Um, and since it's already HTML, it was already running in uh, mobile versions and mobile um, web pages. So that was everything done by one page and developed it for one page to see it with real content. 
Nothing is far more worse than doing this kind of development with um, Oxmox text or link text or lorem ipsum and some fake entries because if you do fa fake entries for menus for example you can imagine that these are in different languages more lang more longer than it or if they are in different languages or if they are just too small or something like that use it with go with real content and see what's behind it so that's what we had we did the HTML prototype and the, it, it combines with the wireframes because it's one thing, so we were ready at this point. And we also had the test pages. What we in this point had, sorry, go back. <laughs> um, So, we had the HTML prototype approved by the customer. From this point, what we did is, we took the existing typography installation, cloned it, and applied the new layout to the existing typography installation, and see what's happened. And so this is the installation with the test pages, and applied the layout, and you can see um, in the video that this almost fits. It's almost working. And the test pages are working. The, um, the elements are working. So if, if you click now on the text elements, um, this, these are the test things. We, we took some image Im elements. Besides, these are the elements we also used for developing the responsive images stuff for the type of free core. Um, and this the structure, so we can use every element in this this area. So um, that was the thing we had um, after um, applying the layout on it. So we are nearly there. We had to do something special, um, but we were nearly there. And as you can see, it's quite a lot of pages we have for the standard elements of Typo Free. You have to look what kind of you have text left, text right, formulas. So it's, it's it's quite a long list. So that's what we had at this point, and then the development in browser is the next step. So we have HTML, CSS development to fine tune the in the contents to fine tune the HTML, and we at least needed the custom approval. So let's have a look how this development in browser is done in detail. Um, we have the area of us, which is Marketing Ferry, and we have the area of Wolfcraft. Uh, first, we start a preview of the web page. Then it was discussed with us and the, the client, modified, was tested in some browsers, and previewed. So this was the wheel we did all day long, modifying the things, optimizing the things, putting it for the devices, putting it for the custom elements, put it, it for the um, product area. And if you put the, the, the um, these are the area of interest is of Wolfcraft, and these are the areas of interest in Marketing Factory. So this process, this rounded process, was done by us together. We presented them a new version on their web page. They previewed it. They give us an information, we modified it, tested it again and again and again. So this was a real interactive way to communicate with the customer. This is a real way to get in touch with him. And this is the step-by-step. -step. So it's doing really often getting in touch, get, give them the new versions, they look at it, give feedback, and so on and so on. That's, uh, we did quite a lot of iterations on it. Um, What's something special we needed to develop for, for um, Wolfcraft was um, the FIG menu, which in 2013, beginning of 2013, was not really existing for responsive layouts. So we needed to develop it, that it's automatically get generated from the uh, product area. We needed to develop something which are really special in displaying the products. They have quite a lot of information about such a product. 
and the article list and some more details. And okay, this one is for maximum 200, 120 kilograms, the weight is 24 kilograms. So this is something we needed to develop, which is quite special and which must be handled also in the responsive way. And you see um, the products are quite different. We have the, the tables and we have router bits, which are um, small, tiny things, which don't need such a description, but they have um, variants of it. Um, so that's something which we needed to dis develop and also develop the tables, which um, here um, have to scroll on a special way in the uh, mobile version. <coughs> and that was also some kind of the main part. That's the same done with the, um, with the mobile version. So that's the way how it looks um, on the iPhone 4, for example. Um, that's possible. And in this case, you see there are no device break, um, device break points, so we, there's, there's quite a lot of white. Um, when you see it on other device, you see two elements besides to each other. It's the same page in, um, as a mobile version. And since we did know device breakpoints, it also perfectly fits on the iPhone 6, which is the simulator images currently now. Um, that's the best thing about not thinking about device breakpoints, thinking about content breakpoints, so it fits automatically to every new device which is there, and it's, it's also working. So that's what we had. and. That was the development of the browser. We finally got the customer approval, and from this point of the customer approval, we already had everything developed, everything was fine, and we um, could really start live. And yes, the result. Um, there was a change in the relationship to the client. The client identification involvement into the project, into the process, was much, much more higher than in other projects where you just show graphical slides and it goes away and four weeks later we are ready. So that was a really nice thing to see that the communication afterwards with the client also improved and got really, really fast and if there are changes, so it's got, got really good. The client um, and we got to a much more faster response time. So if there was a change in this process and the real process, it was really some of these changes were three or four changes per day and they are circled around and around and they, everybody knows that it goes fast and the minor changes and so that was a really nice thing to see that it could be very, very fast if both sides are working together at the same time. The client got a real good knowledge of what, what's happening, what is web design about, what are the technical things about on a meta level. He could understand what we are doing, what's the next step, what's the future of this. And by involving the client, the satisfaction was, was really high because he also learned what we are doing, what amount of work we are doing, what we are thinking about, and so the satisfaction was much more higher instead of just showing um, a Photoshop design and when you're ready, showing the same Photoshop de uh, s same design, and in this process he said, okay, no, there is two pixels, not, not, not fine. In this process, the satisfaction was a much more higher result and there was no wrong or something like that. He knows what's happening and was very satisfied about what's happening. And in the end, the product is the web page. So we have to consider the satisfaction of the users. Um, and we see a dramatically increased mobile traffic. Uh, mobile is tablet and mobile phones, um, which is not only in pages per visit, it's the visit duration and what is more interesting, new users. So this project really paid off for getting more people on the web page, getting more interest in the web page and more information about the product. As you might see, these products are, um, you can buy it in a DIY store, you don't get any people who tell you something about the product. They are in the DIY store, they are looking at the mobiles and have, want inf information about the product. And this is something we really see after in, you know, redesigning, after um, doing the relaunch. Um, the visit duration 
with mobile really, really increased, and that's so, something that people really wanted to have information on their mobile or the products. So for this particular customer, it was really, really paid off. So as it mentioned on their web page, it was step by step, and the result was nearly pe perfect. We are already doing m some minor changes for this. This perfect, this, this process is going on at Goang, but the result for the first relaunch we did with there with, um, with the responsive stuff, it was really perfect, and the customer was really satisfied. So, one, two, three questions. Yes. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you, Ingo, for the insight uh, on this nice project. Um, you said that uh, you had kind of like convinced the customer that he needs a responsive website. So your customer was not the buzzword bingo marketing guy who says, well, we need that responsive website thing. Doesn't know what it is, but he heard it and read it. So they didn't have any idea of it, or they were not aware of it. Um, no, no they, they just know we need something mobile. And the, as, as you see, that's the DIY area. Um, those customers are not very um, technology first, first movers. So they are behind one, two, three years. Maybe now the, the, the DIY um, company is asking us about responsive, but not uh, two years ago. And uh, how did they respond to your approach of not giving them Photoshop mockups? Because, I mean, I mean, who knows that in the of the audience, um, if you talk to a client, uh, to a customer, and they say, well, that's all great, but um, can you do a Photoshop mockup? I mean, it's hard. I, I've, I personally think it's still hard for some customers to understand uh, that it is not, we're, this is a different world now. We don't have a static world anymore. Oh, here. I think it goes into this direction because uh, the customer wants to feel the product. They don't want to see uh, a picture of their website. Regarding responsive design, they want to see how it reacts, how the breakpoint reacts, how does it look on a phone, how does it look on a tablet, and you can't do so many Photoshop pages within an efficient time, so it's much more efficient to do it in the browser and show how it reacts, how it feels, and the customer can see the final product before it's done. Exactly. I mean... And going back to the Photoshop time, we are showing them layouts of something. And he sees an image where it's normally that the image is mounted inside of a browser view so that he can imagine how it looked like. And now he's get a link where it's displayed into the browser. So the process for, for the first layouts is not really changed for the customer because he sees something in a browser view, which is the same as before, but he can scale everything and do it in another browser. So it's um, in terms of convincing that the layout is good or is nice, um, it's, it's the same for the customer. One last from me, then. <laughs> Did you use, because um, I mean, it's nice if you, I think the only people who really take a browser edge and push it together is us. I mean, I don't see customers moving their browsers to simulate um, responsiveness. <laughs> So um, did you use, um, while developing it, and also while showing it and demonstrating to the customer, did you use an open device lab, or did you use your device, or do you have a device lab where you demonstrate to the customer? Because you know it yourself, uh, the, the page looks totally different on an uh, iPhone 5 or 4 than on a Dell venue with Windows 8, for example. Um, yes, the, the, it's something of the education, the, the client. We have to show him that it, the web page reacts. And we convinced him or told him, okay, when you get a new version, look at your browser, look at your boss browser because it's got a bigger screen, open it in your mobile, open it in on your Blackberry of the boss and go home and open it from another s m uh, machine. So they did already know that it's changing. And by the time the, the people recognize, okay, I can have a similar thing in, instead of viewing it the um, iPhone um, by scaling the browser. So that's something about the education. The, the customer learned about it, that he can also scale it, everything, and now he's scaling and everything. It's working like that. So you made, you made, you made him a browser user. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have just one question. How did the designer and developer interaction work in this case? Did they sit together in one room in order to do the changes or, uh, yeah. 
Um, you're referring to that the designer is the one who's doing Photoshop and the developer is doing the one who's doing HTML, CSS. In our case, it's the same people doing this because every designer at our company also knows HTML, CSS and all this stuff and the vice versa. So we have designers which are doing Photoshop and doing HTML and nowadays I'm doing more and more HTML and less Photoshop. So, thank you. Thanks, Ingo. Um, next up is uh, Mr. Sebastian Spill. Yes. Correct pronunciation. And he's going to enlighten us with a journey into a, how can I say, pushing contents from Typo 3 into other channels or, or whatever, or pages. From Typo 3 into Typo 3. From Typo 3 into Typo 3. By not moving it from one part of the page to the other, no. I guess it's more about moving pages, right? Yes. Okay, so. Give me a warm welcome for Sebastian. Here you go. Yeah, welcome everybody to this uh, case study talk about content distribution with Typo 3. This is just my table of contents. Uh, yeah, my name is Sebastian Spill. I work for Sunset AG in Cologne. Um, I work for this company since seven years now and my first contact with Typo 3 was uh, with version 3.8 so it's a long time ago we, now we have version 6.2 um, yeah the content distribution we get in contact with this topic uh, regarding a project we did in 2012 it was a relaunch of credit reform websites and this relaunch was based on Typo 3 before this relaunch they didn't have Typo 3 they have a, a other uh, content management system which was paid and not open source and this relaunch was based on Typo 3. Um, in early 2003 we did a master website creditperform.com and based on this master website we did around 120 adaption websites for their regional sites. For example Credit from Köln, Hamburg, Stuttgart, Berlin, Bonn etc. Um, all these uh, adaptions using the same template and on the technical side all pages are uh, held into one type of three installation and each of this adaption page or satellite page um, presents one page tree and uh, each of this page has its own domain so that's for the technical background and they have several requirements to us how they want to deal with the content uh, because of this co construct holding a master website and satellite pages, they want to create content and push this content into the satellite pages. So um, um, th that was um, uh, something we, we had to came up with ideas how they can achieve it in a smart way because they don't want to duplicate the content and recreate it on each of the satellite pages. And regarding this, they had uh, three requirements. <laughs> they have must content. This is content which must be provided on the satellite pages. And the redactors of the satellite pages are not allowed to change this must content. The second thing is they want to provide can contact a uh, content. This is content the satellite pages can use on their pages, but it's not, not required. And they won't uh, allow the option to add free content to the satellite page. So the redactors can add content they want to their pages. So we came up uh, with the idea of creating an extension for Typo 3. We changed a bit the behavior of Typo 3. Um, and here I want to present the workflow which is uh, provided in the back end with this extension. So we define a content pool. In this content pool you create all your pages you want to share with the satellites. Uh, for example here I defined three pages and these three pages can be pushed into the satellite pages. For example domain A and B um, represents one and another satellite and they have the option in the back end to select uh, for example two pages and push them into the domain A and um, due to this they have four options. They can uh, decide to push the, uh, the pages 
before an existing page, after an existing page, or inside an existing page, and then at the end, at the beginning. That's what you uh, know from type of 3 when you use the withered. And this should demonstrate how a page can look like. For example, this is a satellite page, and the middle red marked content is push content. This, com this is pushed from the master, and uh, the red actors cannot change this content. But they have the ability to add free content um, before and after this pushed content. This is marked in green here. And now I want to give you a live demonstration how this works in the Typo 3 backend, what the red actors can do and what they can't do. So give me a second to log in. So I used the Typo 3 introduction package. This is based on 4.5. Um, the extension is not yet ready for 6.2, but it's in progress. So when it's ready for 6.2, we will put it into the TER so everybody can download and use it. I get a problem with the screen here a bit. Can you see the left side good enough? Yeah, I think so. So what you can see here is uh, are two page trees. Um, the first page tree, which represents the default introduction package, is here. And the second page tree is one satellite page. On the credit reform page, we had uh, 120 satellite pages. But here in this uh, um, example, there's only one. And I give you a short preview of this act. Uh, satellite page. It's very simple. It uh, only um, has uh, three pages. Yeah. And what you can see here now is um, in a it has a special icon with a blue border. And these uh, pages are pushed from the content pool. So you see here the community page, which was pushed to the satellite page and to the master page. And when you have a look at this page in the back end, you see this has three content elements. And when we have a look at this page here, it has only one content element, which is, which, uh, is the free content element they, uh, they created here on this page. Um, when we now have a look in the front end and we Browse to this page. About type is free. Community. You see the structure of the page. It has the three content elements which were pushed from the pool. And before, there is this content element they can add to the page. And this is also shown by an icon which shows an up arrow. This means before. And when we edit this, we can also say it should be after. And now it's after this column elements. And this works for each column in Type 3, for the normal column, the right column, the left border, or what else. Um, and if we have a look at the satellite page, there's also one content element, element which is after the content. So it's similar to the other page now. Yeah. And now I show you how it's done by a red actor. It's very easy because you can create the page once and push it into each of the satellite pages. Um, be, be, before you can do this, you have to structure your page a bit. Um, for example, um, you have to define that this page section is the about section and uh, this page section is the resource section. You, you have to give it some tags. I show you now in the back end. When we added the page properties, you see there is a new uh, text field in the page properties called pool page identifier. And this marks this page as resource 
page. You don't need to do it for each page, you can do it for the pages where you want to push content. For o so only for the, for the page parts, you know there will be uh, push content, you define these pool identifiers. And if we now create a new page, Call it Hyper Three Extensions, and we activate it. And now we create one content element on it. to give this page also an uh, identifier, which is now called extensions. And what you now see in the back end is a new page model on the left side called page wizard. Oh, it's a bit bad from the resolution here. I'll try to make it bigger because it's a very small resolution. Well, it could be not a good idea. And what you see here, now we can make this away. So what you see here is uh, a list of all the pool page identifiers found in the system. And um, we uh, choose the community page. If you choose any other page which is, which is not in the content pool, there will be a warning message that you can't do, um, that you can't push this uh, selected page anywhere. So you can only push pages which are in a content pool. So we select our new created page. And now we can select any page identifier, for example, the resources, which is used here and here. And now um, you see that uh, the extension checks um, the type of three page tree and it founds uh, the home website and the satellite page because the identifier resources is used in these two trees. And now we can say, okay, we want to push it into both pages. Um, and then you have the option to say, okay, I want to insert it before the page, resources, after, or inside. Now we choose inside. And now I have the option to push the pages. What you see here in the legend is um, yeah, a check system. Um, this means if you have more page trees which don't hold these identifier, they get marked red because there you can't push it, because the system doesn't know where to push it then. And um, the green mark means you can't push it because it's, it's already existing there. But here's all fine now. We can select the pages and push the content. So that's done now. We can go back. And if we look at the page tree now, I open the resource section and now you see the page was created into the resource tree here at the first page because we selected this. And if we open the resource tree here, you also see that the page is created there. Now I have to clear the cache. And um, if we now have a look at this page, type of three resources in the front end, you see it helps the content we created in the content pool. And if we do the same here, sorry, wrong page, we also see this content. 
And what you see now here, there is no content on this page actually because it's uh, pushed from the content pool. But now we have the, op the option to create new content. For example, regular text element. We call it test2. And we say after existing content. If we now look at this again, we see the content was created. And the Red Actors has now the possibility to change the pushed content. They can easily go to the page and change the text here. and it's pushed automatically. Yeah, that's it. That's how you can push uh, content elements and pages from a content pool into each section of your page. And that's very easy and, and smart if you have big pages which uh, many domains to uh, push your content. Any questions? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that works the same way. Uh, the question was, um, can translation be used uh, with this extension? And the answer is yes. Um, this uh, extension on the technical side, it creates a new page type, which was uh, marked by the, the blue marking, which is this inherited page. And all it does is it uses TypoScript to um, get the content from the um, pages the content was pushed from and add the content um, which was created on the inherited page. So it just mix it together and uh, shows it combined. So all the translation data would work if you create a power, power, and a power element icon, uh, um, content element there, it will also work. Everything which is stored on the page will work like type of 3 default behavior. Yeah? Uh, what about extensions like this uh, or uh, the page properties like the keyword and the SEO? Yeah. The page properties are, um, are um, also inherited. So it's no problem. And you also have the uh, option to override the page um, properties. I can show you in the live system. So this uh, page gets automatically the same name, but you have the, which is done in the page properties, but you have the option to override this. So the Red Actors can say, okay, uh, in my satellite page, it got another name. Um, news extension should work if you provide um, the, the news plugin here, which reads news, that sh sh uh, would work as well. It works with every content element which is stored on the page. Yes? Regarding news, can you also um, push um, single news, like news items to satellite pages? Like for example, um, you have the category global news, which I would uh, assume would be pushed to the satellites, and maybe local news. Would you then insert two news plugins on the page, or do we have one news plugin and feed it like separately? That doesn't work because um, it only uh, um, inherits the content which is placed on this page, but news is a bit complicated setup. You have uh, the, the content plugin which outputs the news, but you have the, the data stored on another page or on a page folder. And um, for this, you have to hook into news and, and make it work uh, the way you, you need it. But uh, out of the box, it doesn't work with, with um, uh, content elements like, like news or other extensions which reads data out of other tables. Yes? Uh, 
um, what you can do is you can create multiple multiple content pools, and um, but you have to um, match a content pool with a satellite page. Um, for example, you, you can say, I have this content pool which works for these four satellite pages and another content pool for, for other four satellite pages, but you cannot uh, create content in a satellite page and push this somewhere else. So it only works from a content pool. And the content pool must be um, connected to the satellite. i show you here now. When we have a look at the page properties of the satellite page, I don't know in which tab it was. Give me a second. Here. Here you see use content pool A, which is this content pool, and you can defy multiple content pools which are used. But you cannot create the content inside a satellite page and push it from there somewhere else. It only works from the content pool to the satellite pages which are connected to it. Um, no, this, the content pool um, must be a sys folder and must be defined as content pool and then it automatically um, is available in the select box here for the satellite pages. Yes? Yeah, we can test this behavior, of course. <laughs> yeah. um, the question was, what happens um, with a page which was inherited when the uh, page in the content pool is deleted, correct? Okay. Yes. For example, we uh, did this for the Typo3 extension page. We have special content here and the content which was pushed. And now we delete the type of three community page. Oh, yes. And we clear the cache. <laughs> and now we have a look at this page. You see now the page is gone. Yeah. Yes, the the page is deleted and the and the uh, content element is also deleted. In Typo3 it's not really deleted, you know, it's marked as deleted, but um the whole page is gone because um when the master website says we don't want this page the focus is more on deleting it everywhere than uh, keeping the, the individual content. Yes? Uh, currently not. <laughs> but it's a good idea for the future, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, it's like this. When you um, push content from the content pool and you have a link created there, the link is always prepended with the base domain of the uh, page where you of the, of the page tree where you created the content element. So, so this will work. So it will always point it to the to the right page. So you don't get any problem there. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. Nice little tool. And uh, is this your office? Uh, yeah, this was my office. And, yeah, 
<laughs> nice office. <laughs> okay, next up uh, we have uh, Asker here. And uh, I just peeked in his uh, into his computer and now I know what he's talking about. <laughs> because I forgot him to put on the program here. Um, I think Asker is talking about a transition or transition of a web project from Type 3 CMS into Neos, correct? Yes. So, okay. Have some fun. Thank you. Um, thanks for your attention and being here. Um, this is a bit of a mystery talk. It was supposed to be about another project, um, which is also Neos based, but that project uh, got delayed. But fortunately, uh, we have another big project, which is actually even more interesting, that we launched uh, this Friday. So it's very new, very fresh, and uh, very exciting for us. Um, before I start here. Um, yeah, so as Robert said, it's uh, relaunching Venstar.dk, um, a transition from CMS to NIAS. Um, who am I? My name is Eske and I live in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, I'm a partner and work as a team lead, a team lead at a company called Muck. Um, I'm also acting as the release manager of NIAS 1.2. Um, and I've been a member of this NIAS team since 2011. Um, shortly about the client. So the client is a political party in Denmark, the liberal one we, we have. Um, it's the, older par the oldest party uh, and it's the largest. Uh, they have the most mandates in parliament. Um, they have 47 and they have uh, more candidates. Um, in total, they have about 45, uh, 44,000 members. Um, and out of those, there are about 10,000 uh, active ones in local and regional politics, which also uh, integrate to this website. Um, so the project we're doing is the main website for them. We're doing other, pro other websites for them as well. Um, it's the second relaunch that we've done at uh, Mark. Um, and it's a pretty big project in the terms that it's more than 1,500 hours. It's likely to be somewhere around 2,000, I guess, uh, over the next few years. Um, some of the goals of doing a relaunch has been they wanted more flexibility. They wanted to have uh, more social integration with the social media like Twitter and Facebook. Um, in terms of flexibility, what they wanted is uh, to be able to create more uh, kind of pages and they were kind of locked in their current uh, in their previous uh, um, website. So um, another thing that they really wanted to have is uh, improve usability because they have a, a press um, team that only uses Type Free once in a while and they only do news and for them the workflow that is in CMS is really not something that they uh, like using. Um, and then we had to do a responsive website um, so we kind of had to redo most of the front end anyway so it made sense. Um, what else? They really wanted to have reusable content because they have quite some content um, and creating it uniquely for every page doesn't really make much sense. Um, and to do this, we took a card-based approach, um, which I'm going to explain a bit about. So if you haven't heard about a card-based approach, it's um, a card is a unique uh, data set of related data for a single object. Um, it could be an image or a link or some text um, all um, from the same object and it's for instance what you see on Pinterest uh, um, and what it usually acts like is a entry point to more detail and complex information so it's kind of like a teaser so to say um, some of the features that we have on this website uh, which might be interesting because it's NIAS and you might be doubting how, wh what you can actually do with NIAS. 
Um, we are doing uh, integration with web services, which is, fits really well because we have Flow to do it with. Uh, it's much nicer to, than doing anything in XBase or PI base. Um, we have uh, pages for these 9,000 uh, or almost 10,000 persons. So actually, they all have their own page. Um, we have news articles with tagging. We have social media import uh, of posts and, and sharing of pages. Um, we have some member sign up using forms and payment for that. Um, and then, yeah, we have all this uh, focus on reusing content and optimizing the editor experience. Uh, so I'm going to show some examples because that's kind of the best way of doing it. Um, in this example or video, what we see is how uh, a person has a page which they can add additional data uh, on the page, um, which is then used elsewhere. Uh, in this example, I, oh, you almost cannot see it, uh, poor resolution. But what's being entered here is um, the Twitter and Facebook account details. And when I hit apply, that information is, is then stored. So we start fetching uh, those posts um, uh, so we can display them elsewhere on the website. Um, yeah, additionally, it's possible to write text about the person, set the image, and, and stuff like that. So um, that's also something we can reuse. Um, because we have so many persons, it's not really something you want to show in a, in a tree. Um, what you see here is uh, all the candidates. So that's like the 90, uh, 97 candidates, because that's not too many. And that's, those are the persons that they edit most. Uh, but they have ev everyone else, which they might want to add some details about as well. And to do that, we use this search functionality uh, where when you search, you actually search between all of them and not just those seen in the tree, um, which is a nice feature. Um, yeah, so then we have uh, displays of these uh, persons. And what we do is uh, we group them by titles or types, we call them, actually. And that is kind of like what the role is the political part in the political party is. And some of them have many. So they appear on various lists, um, especially the parliament politicians. Um, and yeah, what they do is they just uh, click the content element, and then they select what kind of uh, types they want to show. Um, we have another view of this, which is a bit more card based just to show that a card can actually be more than just what you might think of a card, but also a row. Uh, it's just a different uh, presentation form. And if it reloads, is it? Yes, there you see. Um, this makes sense for all of those that have images, but if they don't, it doesn't really make much sense and looks weird. You can see the blue one where they have a picture missing. Um, so the next one, I just wanted to show you how it was before, because we did not use TT News as most people do. We actually did optimize it quite a lot for the editor experience, but still it didn't really feel uh, nice to work with. So what we did is we used TT News, but when they create news, they create a news page and that news page is automatically connected to a TT News record uh, with, that has the type external link. And if they change something, uh, the record is updated and stuff. Um, but yeah, you, you know how it works to create pages. Um, and that's not really something that the editors was happy to, with. Uh, I'm just going to quickly switch here. So now it's like this. Um, they have inline editing that actually see what they're doing. Um, it, they didn't have the problem of only being able to do text in the uh, uh, text editor because they had the pages. Um, so there's, 
they're just used to this uh, form of working with multiple types of content on a page um, already. Uh, but what we can do now is that we have tags that they add to the news article. They can add people, which are these members, and they can add an author, which is also searching in these pages. And what then happens is that you see the people that are connected to this uh, news article, which is uh, usually the case because all the news that they write about is, has some kind of political statement from one of their politi politicians. Um, and you have uh, the author also being um, one of these members. In this case, it's usually something, someone from the press, which is an employee, and therefore they're um, imported as well. Uh, for the lists, what we do is simply allowing them to select what tag they want to show in the list. Uh, there's not really anything uh, fancy about it, but what they can do is just create all the lists that they, they want to have, and, and they have, I don't know, uh, maybe, yeah, you see them there, how many different ones they have, and they can combine multiple tags to create one bigger topic, uh, which is needed in some cases. Uh, the way that we do these uh, tags is by uh, having them as node types, um, uh, document node types in the tree. Um, the hierarchical structure doesn't really mean much. It could if we wanted it to, but in this case, it doesn't matter. Um, so they just create node tags by creating new uh, document uh, tag documents. Um, it could also be implemented just as a free based, uh, free form um, tax, but they actually want to have some structure, so it's more formalized. Um, yeah, so how does all of this come together? Um, it comes together when we have the section pages, because the section pages then uses all of these different kinds of uh, reusable content to create. Um, Centrals for leading elsewhere on the site. Um, this is the front page. It could also be uh, a section page for, for something else. Um, and the way it works is that they have all these different opportunities to insert in content. Um, for instance, uh, this video is showing how they insert uh, normal cards uh, just with text, um, where they then have the, the possibility to um, put the text on there in line. They see exactly how it's going to look. Um, they create links and upload images and, and stuff like that. Um, dun -dun. Yeah, um, and they both have colored cards and, and all their cards. What they then also can do is insert an article card where they can search for a specific article. It could be that they want to put something on the front page that is really important uh, and very hot topic at the moment. And then they could kind of make it sticky even though it's not the newest um, article. Uh, when it reloads, you see it. Um, this is on the right, the, the one that I found just before. Uh, which you cannot really read. Um, alternatively, what they can do is insert a article tax card, which just gets the latest um, articles based on tax. And if they don't put any, they just get all of them, of course. Um, additionally, they have the possibility to insert um, these person cards again, if they want to, um, for instance, show the, the leader of the, of the party uh, on the front page. Um, I'm a bit in front, I can see, but <laughs> um, what's happening here is just inserting specific uh, article uh, from a specific tax. Um, so, yeah. So there we got the person card, and they select it, and then you search for a person.
then you see the person showing up and you have the possibility to also make them white to have even more focus on uh, certain cards. This can be done for news cards and person cards and some of the text card and video cards and what have you. Um, then we have social posts where they can just select how many they want to show right now, but it's planned that they will be able to select what person's uh, accounts they want to have in specific places. Um, again, it could be some politicians in certain areas and stuff. It could also be um, showing social posts that has some tags uh, that matches what the article is about. Um, there's plenty of possibilities there to connect the, the content uh, uh, around the article with, with other stuff because there's um, a lot of stuff going on on social media uh, regarding politics and they want to kind of drag that in and do stuff like that. Um, so why does NIAS fit? Uh, it fits because NIAS is really well tailored for reusing content. Uh, it's very easy to do it and uh, it just feels natural uh, way of working um, when you do NIAS projects. Um, if we did it in CMS, it wouldn't feel uh, the same. It's perfectly possible, um, of course. Um, NIAS also makes content creation very easy um, in the sense that they have these article pages where they just click and, 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 and then they see what they're actually going to get and they don't have all this abstraction going on. Um, NIAS fits really well for having multiple document types. This is something that you can do in CMS, but it's really awkward. You're just either doing extreme flex forms or um, ex extending the page uh, table uh, with everything. Um, it's not really built to do it, but it can do it, but it just feels awkward. Um, what else? Yeah, we have the same technical solution for the list, which means, uh, and, and the search. So when we want to do a search, then all we have to do is copy what we already use and remove some of the type filters uh, for what different kind of content we want to have. Um, so actually that's kind of built in because of the way it's, it's built. We don't have any plugins except for one, which is for the member sign up with payment. Um, this is also really cool that we don't have to uh, create plugins and controllers and all that stuff because it's very unflexible. Instead, what we can do um, in, in NIAS is use TypeScript where we can reuse the parts in different ways. So if we have a search filter or a, a search list, then we can use the same one for news. We can use it for the general search, we can use it for persons, um, because we can just inherit uh, certain functionality. Um, yeah, as I said, no abstraction. Uh, this is really a key point to this, because uh, if you have a look here again, uh, just imagine how difficult it would be to uh, like get a feeling of what you're doing if you had this abstraction where you insert elements in the back end, you select certain records, and then you go to the front end to see what actually happens. Here you have the direct uh, feedback uh, when you need it. Um, so this is really a major point of it. Can I skip it? Yes. Um, there's probably more <laughs> that I didn't think of. Um, further de development is search. Um, and some of you might be thinking of what's going to happen when they create hundreds of news articles in the tree. Uh, that's not really user friendly. Um, we know that and it's something that we want to do something about in NIAS. So we have uh, a better way of working with large trees um, or a lot of content that is more stream based than our article. So it's something that we're going to, to, to work on, but for now it's, it's okay for them. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so everything you see that we use here 
is available uh, in the next uh, NIAS version. Um, I think the only thing we actually needed to implement for this project is multiple select in select boxes. Um, and yeah, so that's pretty cool. Um, this project is actually quite um, interesting as well because the customer has been a customer of Tab Free in many, many years and they've gone through all the old versions uh, to the new ones and now they have NIOS and they're very satisfied. So it's not like it's they don't know uh, how it used to be um, and stuff. So yeah, that's it. And uh, yeah. So we have time for questions, if anybody has any. Well, thanks of all. Uh, first of all, Aske, um, the demo that you did, um, was it um, captured on your MacBook, so on your local environment, or was it uh, captured from a server environment? Um, it was captured on a server environment on this Wi-Fi thing, and <laughs> not very... Um, it, it locally it runs a lot faster, uh, but I wanted the content from the actual site, so, yeah. Uh, yep. Oh, were you able to reuse any of the existing Tapestry content which they had accumulated for eight years and how difficult it was for you if you did it? Yeah, so um, in this case we were actually lucky because um, due to them being a political party, their, their news get old and they don't want to keep the old news. Um, <laughs> but what we actually started uh, talking about migrating all the old news and we would have been able to do that just fine. It wouldn't have been much of a problem. Uh, in terms of actual content on the side, it's not that much, so they just do it. Um, m most of it is like uh, the members and, and how they're dis displayed and how you can find them and all that stuff. Um, yeah, so. so we were lucky. And also we didn't uh, need translation and we didn't need access rights. Uh, but both of those will soon be something that you can do anyway, so yeah. Have another one back there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you impressively demonstrated how you can put together uh, lists of news by just giving out the tags. Um, how do you implement kind of uh, switching between news from a specific tag? So from a communications perspective, I would say, let's think about putting together a topic-specific um, news page with a lot of articles, but this one particular news, I don't want to I don't want to show up. So um, is there a possibility to exclude single records or do you have to go back to the record, remove the label and, um, well, destroy all the good work done before? Um, that's a good question and interesting that you should ask that because uh, we don't have that issue for news, but we have it for persons. So there are certain persons that cannot show up even though they have certain titles or types. Um, and the way we did that is on this uh, person page, we select do not show up if this uh, is the tag that's being included. Um, so it's kind of on the actual page that you decide, I don't want to have this there. Um, but I mean, NIAS is flexible, so you could do however you wanted it to do uh, mostly. So. But that's how we solve it in that case. But it depends on like how many and how the use case is exactly, I guess. So hmm? seems like there's no more questions. Well, yeah. Thanks for your time. Um, <laughs> I have a small bonus, which uh, might interest you. Um, so now. Maybe you know NIAS. Uh, and a certain feature in NIAS actually comes from another project from this client, 
where we did all the candidates' personal websites. Um, and the thing is that uh, it's pretty recognizable. Uh, here we also did some uh, inline uh, editing of interface because the editors didn't really want to uh, work in the typography backend. Um, but you see in the corner that you have this orange and green publishing thing that made it into Um uh, Additionally, this kind of project wouldn't be necessary to do anymore because Nias kind of is what we made back then, where the editor can do things without actually learning much about the CMS. And that's especially important when you have politicians that doesn't have time to do stuff like this and only does it very rarely. Um, so yeah, just a small side thing. But, yeah. Thank you, Oscar. So I guess we can go over 10 minutes lunch break or coffee break. <laughs>